Hello and welcome to an overview of public health and the incident command system. This course will address the unique role that public health plays in disaster response within the framework of the incident command system. We'll start by going over the course objectives. After this course, you'll be able to recognize the key concepts of the disaster cycle, understand the relationship between public health and response partners using the incident command system, identify the various roles of public health during a disaster, and describe the importance of pre-incident planning and training of public health personnel. This course is divided into four modules. Part A is an overview of the disaster response cycle. Part B is a review of the incident command system and its underlying principles. Part C is a look at public health's role in the disaster response cycle as it relates to the incident command system. In Part D, we'll take a look at a case study where the principles we've talked about in Parts A, B, and C are applied. And we'll finish with a course summary where we'll go over the principles of the course so far. Diving right into our review of the disaster response cycle. When a disaster strikes, who's the first group that comes to mind who's going to respond to that event? Is it the fire services? Maybe the military or the National Guard? Perhaps it's the Red Cross or other nonprofit agencies like the Salvation Army. Maybe it's the police or even it's emergency medical services. Or does it really depend on the disaster as to who responds? Maybe it's this entire group, maybe it's smaller segments of that group. But what about public health? Did any of you think about public health as a primary responder to a disaster event? We've talked about the agencies that might respond to a disaster event, but we have to talk about the scale of the disaster and how the scale of that disaster might affect the jurisdictions where those agencies hail from and how that might affect their ability to provide resources to combat that disaster and where they might have to reach to receive the necessary resources. So we start at the local level. In a small community of 15,000 people, a multi-story office building fire would be a huge undertaking for a small fire department. They would require resources, probably from the county or regional level, to respond to that event. Whereas if we think about that multi-story office building fire in the heart of a major metropolitan area like Chicago or New York City, those cities' fire departments are trained and equipped to handle disasters of that magnitude. We look at the statewide level. We think about things like forest fires, major floods, other major localized weather events. At that level, the resources combined between the local, county, or region, and state governments are able to effectively respond to those events. But then we move on to the national level. We think about those incidents of major national significance, things like Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, that required national level coordination of resources from multiple states, counties, regions, cities, and towns in order to effectively combat that disaster and effectively protect the people that they're serving. When first responders are trained on disaster response, they're trained on three important principles. The first being life safety, the second being incident stabilization, and the third being property or environmental preservation. Life safety, of course, is paramount, saving lives. Incident stabilization is bringing the incident under control where recovery can begin. And property and environmental preservation, saving homes, saving businesses, keeping pollutants out of the environment. But where does public health fit into this? And something we're going to discuss as we move further along in the course, it fits a little bit in each column. And it really depends on the nature of the disaster. And that's what makes public health so unique. When we look at disaster response how, and how it relates to public health, we can break it down by those three principles, life safety, incident stabilization, and property and environmental preservation. So if we start with life safety, 
What are some things that public health does that relates to life safety? We could start maybe with prophylaxis and treatment. Maybe it's public health running an emergency vaccine clinic or running a dispensing site that's handing out doses of ciproflaxin in response to an anthrax attack. Maybe it's public health setting up and operating an emergency shelter for the victims of a tornado or a flood or a building fire. Or maybe it's even public health working as part of a mass decontamination unit looking for the pollutant that contaminated the individuals going through the tent, working to help triage the individuals coming out of the tent, reunite them with their families, provide them with follow-up medical care or follow-up advice to seek medical care. Moving on to incident stabilization, public health can play a variety of roles in this principle. They could be providing risk assessments of pollutants that have been released into the atmosphere, looking at the potential effects on downwind properties. They could be looking at the effects of a pollutant release into a water supply and what might have to take place in order to make that supply safe to drink. They could be providing epidemiological awareness, tracking disease outbreaks in real time, or tracking the efficacy of treatments that have already been given for a potential disease outbreak. They could be working on responder safety. A medical reserve corps unit working under a public health department could be providing responder rest breaks, could be providing water, food, shelter on scene of a major disaster event. They could be working on agent identification, simply trying to detect what that agent is that contaminated all these people that are lined up out in front of the ER of a hospital on a hot summer afternoon. They could even be just looking at where we can get safe food and water to feed those people that we just put in a temporary shelter because of the tornado that just tore through their community. After we've addressed life safety and stabilized the incident, public health still plays a role in property and environmental preservation. For property preservation, public health starts out looking at habitability. Is the structure habitable? Is it safe for someone to move back into? Does it have a safe drinking water supply? Does it have safe sewage disposal? Does it provide a safe environment for them to bring their children home to? Are there any hazards involved? Are there chemical hazards, microbiological hazards, physical hazards? If they're chemical hazards, microbiological hazards, what kind of guidance do we need to give the individuals at that property to clean it up? On the environmental side, we go back to contaminant ID. Just like in incident stabilization, we need to identify what's been released into the environment, what steps we need to take to clean it up, both in the short term and the long term. So as you can see, because of the roles that public health can play in life safety, in incident stabilization, and in property and environmental preservation, they really are a jack of all trades. And you'll see this further as we discuss the incident command system and all the different places that you can plug public health into your incident command module. As we begin part B, we're going to review the incident command system. As you know from your prior training, the incident command system is an organizational structure that's built on four main principles. The first principle is unity and chain of command. The second principle is a proper span of control. The third principle is the use of common terminology. And the fourth principle is integrated communications. And when you put those four principles together, build an organizational structure around them, you get an effective response to disaster events. To continue our review of the Incident Command System, or ICS, we're going to break down those four underlying principles a little bit further. We're going to start with the first two, chain of command, unity of command, and span of control. Chain and unity of command are interrelated. The chain of command, as represented by the incident command system chart you see here on the slide, is very simple. It's a defined system of managers and subordinates. It defines who you receive orders from and who you give orders to and so on. So you can see moving from the food unit under the logistics section, they report to the service branch. 
who reports to the logistics section, who reports to the incident commander. It's a simple chain to follow. Unity of command is part of the chain of command in the fact that under a unity of command, you receive orders from one person. So that person gives you a set of orders. When you have progress to report, you will report back to that same individual, not to a person above that person, not to a person below you, not to a person laterally across the chart. Span of control is a way to manage command. Various management studies have found that, especially in emergency response events, to effectively manage people, you need a minimum of three direct reports and a maximum of seven direct reports. Really, under the incident command system, the optimum number of people reporting to you is five individuals. If you have too few people reporting to individuals, so you have a bunch of people with two direct reports, you've effectively created a layer of middle management that will slow the response. But on the other extreme, if you have one person with 20 direct reports, they cannot effectively manage all of the information flowing up from those 20 individuals to make the appropriate command decisions to send the orders back down in an efficient manner. As we continue to talk about command within the incident command system, there's another command concept that should be brought up, and that's unified command. Now, when you're at a disaster response event, you're not just going to have the fire department in charge, or just the police department in charge, or maybe just the National Guard in charge. You're going to have a number of agencies at this major response. All of those agency heads, operational heads, are going to be there. They're going to have their own groups out in the field as part of the overall incident command system. So a lot of times the most effective way to manage command decisions is to develop a unified command. That's where you take the agency heads from each one of those jurisdictions or groups. We put them together and they manage under the same set of operational principles and make one set of command decisions that goes out to the entire operational response force. Another principle of the incident command system is the use of common terminology. This really grew out of where the incident command system was born from, fighting wildland forest fires in the, in the Mountain West of the United States and bringing together fire departments from the federal government, from state governments, from county governments and local governments, from multiple states to fight these large forest fires. And all the different things they call the same exact piece of equipment. Trying to determine a way so that when somebody got on the radio and called for a bus, they knew that they were calling for an ambulance and not a school bus to transport firefighters. So if you think about a few terms that get tossed around in an emergency response event, something like EMS. Well, EMS could stand for emergency medical services, an emergency medical specialist, or it could mean somebody needs to send somebody to Eastern Mountain Sports, which is a sporting goods retailer in the Northeast United States, to buy a set of carabiners or a climbing harness. We've talked about the ambulance example. Some, in some places in the country, ambulances are called buses. Other times they're called paramedic units, or they're just called an ambulance. So it's not only use, it's using common terminology for the resources, but it's also using common terminology for the titles and the positions. You saw in the chart on the previous slide, those were set titles. Things like Operations Section Chief, Logistics Section Chief ground support leader, task force. Task force could be just about anything, but it's called a task force. They can be task force one, task force north, task force B, whatever the case may be. So, but everybody who is trained in the incident command system understands that, that task force has a specific role. They understand what it means to be the operations section chief, that you're going to be running the 
spear of the operation. You're going to be leading on the front lines. As far as resources are concerned, there are guidelines for those too. FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security have developed huge binders and huge guides that define resources all the way down to the type of stretcher that you might need or the type of bulldozer that you might need. And those guides are available for logistics staff to be able to find the right equipment, procure the right equipment, and have it available for the operations staff to use. And the last principle we're going to talk about, integrated communications. We can all understand unity of command, chain of command, make sure we're managing the right amount of people in our span of control. We're working under a unified command structure in our incident command system. We're all using common terminology. But what if we can't talk to each other? Are we on UHF? Are we on VHF? Are we on 900 megahertz trunked? Are we working on secure lines? Are we using ham radio operators and amateur radio? Are we using cell phones? Are we using Nextel Direct Connect? The key word here that gets tossed around a lot in response situations is interoperability. And millions upon millions of dollars have been spent at the federal, state, county, local level to make emergency response units more interoperable. But there are still communities out there where the fire department uses a UHF radio and the police department uses a VHF radio. And they're working on ways to integrate their communications into one. And that's a long-term process. But it's a key process that will have to happen in order to achieve that ICS principle of having truly integrated communications to manage an effective response. As we begin our next module, Part C, the public health roles in the disaster response, we have to think about where public health fits in. We've talked about the incident command system. We've talked about the roles public health can play in a disaster response. So what roles are there for public health? Are they operational roles as responders under the operations section? Are they support roles in the logistics section, the planning section, or even finance and administration? Do we put them in command? Are they part of our functional groups? We're going to explore all of these as we talk about the public health role in the disaster response. We talked about public health being a jack of all trades and able to be plugged into a number of different areas of the incident command system. We can start out at the command level and we can look at public health serving perhaps as the public information officer, providing that necessary information about sanitation issues in a flood or how to stay safe in a disease outbreak. Perhaps they can serve as the safety officer. The safety officer in an incident command system is responsible for the safety of all the responders working under that ICS. So public health, with their knowledge of risks and hazards, makes a great fit in this location. Public health also works with a number of different agencies on a day-to-day -day basis, making them a good fit as a liaison officer coordinating all of those different non-governmental and governmental entities who are on site to provide additional resources. Of course, public health can work in the operations section, usually under groups, sometimes under branches, running things like shelters or immunization clinics or serving on inspectional teams to keep up with a hazard analysis. Public health can be in the planning section, usually some in the situation unit, and the Situation Unit provides what's called situational awareness. It's that up-to-date information that's provided to the incident command system so that the commanders at the upper levels can make the appropriate decisions. You know, whether that's disease information from epidemiological tracking or that's pollutant flow information through a water supply, public health is there and can provide that information. You can put public health in the logistics section perhaps in the medical unit. The medical unit in the logistics section provides medical services to first responders, to those working in the operations, planning, 
logistics, and finance and administration sections. Public Health, through its Medical Reserve Corps, could be providing responder support activities. Maybe it's food, water, and rest periods for responders fighting a major forest fire. And finally, you can always plug public health into finance and administration, handling paperwork, handling follow-up with grant monies or other monies that would be due to the operation after recovery is complete. We just finished discussing the different places that public health fits into the incident command structure when it comes to an actual response event. But prior to that response event, public health plays a key role as a planning partner to prepare for that response. Public safety planners working on their emergency preparedness plans need to bring public health into the picture at an early stage. Public health, as we've seen as jack-of-all-trades, bring a variety of resources to the table that may not be extant in current public safety operations. So if you bring public health in at the beginning when you're drafting your plans and you look at the resources that public health has available, whether those are technical resources from a knowledge standpoint, an equipment standpoint, their staffing resources from technical specialists who can be deployed to the field, or a medical reserve corps who can bring an army of volunteers with medical credentials ready to be deployed. So when you bring those planning aspects together from public health, combine them with your already strong public safety plans, you can really develop a stronger comprehensive plan that addresses the whole of your response. And so you're not handing out business cards and introducing yourselves at the response event. Public health has been integrated and public health is there when the call goes out that a response is necessary. Part of that planning process is training. Everybody that's going to use the incident command system, be involved in a potential emergency response event, has to go through ICS training, incident command system training. Whether that's taking courses like ICS 100 and 200, or taking courses in the National Incident Management System, NIMS 700 or 800, or any number of the other acronym-laced courses that the federal government has put forth for training first responders. It's important to include public health in those in cross-jurisdictional classes. You don't want to have just all police and fire in a class together when public health is going to be there at the response event with you. By bringing public health into your training plan, just as bringing them into your planning process, those first-line responders, whether from public health, fire, EMS, a state health department, or non-governmental operations like the Red Cross. They can all be in the same room, all be learning the same material, and working through the activities together so they can learn how the other jurisdictions, how the other agencies think. They can learn thought processes. Public health can learn so much from police and fire who have a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience in responding to everyday emergencies. And they can take that knowledge and apply it to the public health response that they're developing in concert with public safety planning efforts. Next we're going to look at a case study example where public health was integrated into the incident command system during an ice storm event with power loss and property damage. This case study example takes place in a suburban New England community where we know an ice storm is coming. Public safety, public works, they have their response plan in place. So they're doing their pre-incident planning. They're having meetings ahead of time. What kind of staffing are we going to need? What kind of equipment are we going to need to pre-stage? How much brine do we have to pre-treat the roads? How many plows do we have to deploy? What kind of power outages are we expecting? And then public health is brought in. What resources can public health bring to bear? What do you have available as far as staff? Are your volunteers able to be called up? Do they have transportation to get to a site if we need to open a shelter? 
Do you have the necessary equipment to open a shelter? What about food, water? Do we have a location in place where we would have emergency power should power go out? As public health was brought into the planning process during this case study, we look at the three principal areas of emergency response. We start with life safety. Public health is there to assist with immediate food resources, immediate shelter resources, using their volunteer forces and their staffing to stand up an emergency shelter in a community where there's been ice storm damage and power loss. Public health also has that unique link to local health care facilities and other high needs populations. Maybe it's the elderly within the community. Public health working through the local Council on Aging is able to reach out to the elderly, do wellness checks, and see if they need transportation to get to the shelter or be able to provide their caretakers the information to get them there. Linkage to those potentially group homes or other isolated individuals who may need resources but may be quote unquote off the grid from an awareness level for the first responders. Under incident stabilization, public health may need to operate a modified shelter in a longer term for those individuals who've had major roof damage or who cannot have power restored to their dwelling as of yet because of power lines down. And perhaps they have no other option but to stay in a community shelter. They can't afford a hotel. They don't have the necessary resources to come into play. Public health is also out working with local restaurant operators and other food service establishments. After an extended power outage, public health has to ensure that the food supply that is out there is safe and able to be served safely to the public. So that involves going to each individual establishment, determining how long the power was out, what protections were in place for the food that was stored there, and if necessary, ordering the disposal of that food and replacement with safe food before service is reopened. Under property preservation, public health, usually under the tenets of statewide public health codes, looks at the habitability of dwellings. Perhaps it's the simple necessity of having power to that dwelling so that heat can be provided. That power may also power a well to provide safe drinking water, or it may power a component of a septic system to provide safe sewage disposal. And public health is also looking at the cleanup after the storm and making sure that materials are being disposed of in a manner that will not pollute the environment that hazardous materials are not being thrown out with green waste so that we end up with trees and branches mixed in with cans of paint or whatever the case may be going to an area maybe where they're being burned or where they're being buried and could pot potentially contaminate groundwater. Moving along with our case study, we go back to our suburban New England community preparing for the onslaught of the winter ice storm and we look at their comprehensive planning efforts have generated an incident command system chart. And within that chart, public health has been plugged into a number of key roles because they are such a jack of all trades operation. Starting in the operations section, a key member of the public health staff has been designated as the shelter section chief. This team member will be responsible for the operation of the community emergency shelter that will provide food, water, and a safe place to rest for those individuals whose property is damaged and no longer have a place to call home. Next, we've taken a key, another member of the public health staff and we've put them as the recycling group supervisor. In a number of communities, public health supervises the disposal of solid waste and recyclables. So public health has that technical knowledge as to what has to go where and what has to be disposed of and in what manner. And so this is a place where that key technical knowledge can be put to play. In this case, the public health staff has also been designated as the planning section chief. 
as part of the comprehensive planning process, it was determined that a key member of the public health staff was an excellent planner and was someone who would function well developing plans for the next operational periods of the event. And so therefore, under the incident command system, since they were the most qualified for the position, they were placed into the position of planning section chief. Public health has also been put as the food unit leader under the support branch of the logistics section. Now the food unit in this case is providing food to the responders who are working within the incident command system. The reason this person was put into the food unit leader's position is they happen to be the local restaurant inspector. So they have a number of relationships already with managers and owners of local food establishments from grocery stores to gas stations and restaurants and can quickly bring about the necessary food resources to take care of the responders. So it's one less thing the responders have to worry about as they are functioning within their roles. As we discussed previously, public health makes a great safety officer because of their knowledge of the risks and hazards that might be faced during a response event. So in this case, public health has also been designated as one of the safety officers. Finally, public health has been put into part of the unified command. With the number of roles that public health staff are playing within the incident command system, it made sense that the public health director was put into unified command with the police chief and the fire chief and the town manager in this community so that those command decisions can be made under one set of objectives and move the entire response forward in an efficient and an effective manner. Diving a little deeper into our case study, we're going to take a closer look at public health's role in the operations section, specifically that as the shelter branch chief. So we have a community shelter operating, housing a number of residents, feeding them, and keeping clean drinking water and a roof over their heads. That shelter branch chief has a number of individuals reporting to them, all still within their span of control and maintaining the chain of command and unity of command that we've talked about when we talk about the incident command system. That shelter branch chief has a deputy to help manage the operations. They have their own separate smaller operations group where they have a shelter medical operation for both clinical issues that might crop up from those in need of medical care at the shelter and also mental health issues. This is a very high stress situation. People's homes have been damaged, they've lost power, they may be worried about other loved ones or pets and they're going to need that mental health support to help keep them sane in a somewhat crazy environment. You have a registration and discharge task force making sure that everybody who walks in the door is registered and accounted for and that when they leave that that's also accounted for so that nobody goes missing from the shelter. You of course have a dormitory management operations handling mass feeding and other client services like making sure they have shampoo and towels to be able to use the showers at this community shelter which happens to be in a high school gymnasium so they have the, high, the locker rooms available. Of course you have a security operation usually run by a police officer or another member of law enforcement to provide that additional presence in the operation. You have a shelter support group supporting the operations of the shelter with communications and a quartermaster to hand out equipment to manage the flow of resources into and out of the shelter operation. A key piece of mental health but separate from the clinical aspects of mental health that this suburban community recognized was a chaplaincy supervisor someone from the local churches who the citizens would know and would feel comfortable going to if they had issues that they felt needed to be addressed. And finally, as we found with Hurricane Katrina, many people will not evacuate without their cherished pets. 
and so this shelter has a domestic animal group supervisor running a small domestic animal shelter operation in another section of the building where those residents of the shelter can visit their pets for a time being, have that additional relaxation of spending time with their pets and knowing that their pets are safe and help keep them in the shelter until that time that it's safe for both the individual and the pet to go home. As part of our case study, we take a step backward in time to what led to this suburban New England community having such a comprehensive planning program. And that goes back to a previous response event before public health was really involved in local planning. Public health was, was called out to assist with an emergency response. They really hadn't been involved in the planning process. So there was very limited interoperability between public health staff and first responder staff. Both from a communications perspective, public health was unfamiliar with the radio systems, did not have the radio systems to communicate with first responders. Public health was mainly relying on cell phones, which were spotty during that response event. The members of the first responder operations, those on the front lines, were unfamiliar with all the different roles that public health could play, all the resources they could bring to bear from a knowledge standpoint, from an equipment standpoint, from a technical standpoint. And so they were unable to effectively utilize public health in those roles. And finally, because public health had not trained with those responders, had not been involved in the planning process, they were operating in their own separate chain of command, reporting to an incident command system, but not integrated within it. And so therefore, they did not have that unity of command. They were not part of the overall chain of command. And so those commands sometimes took more time to reach public health, and public health was unsure of the tasks that they were supposed to undertake versus the first responders. So this led to a partial breakdown in emergency response efforts, and therefore led to bringing public health to the table as part of the comprehensive planning effort that led to an effective response to the ice storm that recently occurred. As a result of that previous event, public health was brought into the planning and training process. They were issued radios and trained on how to use those radios in a response event, how to use common terminology that's key in the incident command system. They made sure that those radios would speak to both police and fire and EMS within the community so that when public health was called, they would know when to answer, how to answer, and where to report. They were part of the training that went into the first responders' normal training program. They were there in the incident command system courses with firefighters and police officers. The senior public health staff were there in the command training courses with the fire chief, the deputy chief, his captains, the police chief, the deputy police chief. They all spoke the same language. They had trained together. They had worked on group exercises together. So they understood how the other one thought and the resources that public health brought to bear and then public health understood the resources and the mission of fire, police, and EMS. Public health was also, as we discussed, brought in, into the planning process. And as part of that, those comprehensive emergency response plans were developed where the role of public health wasn't just a word on a piece of paper. It was public health will do the following during a response event. During an ice storm event, public health will be responsible for setting up and operating an emergency shelter. The food inspector will be responsible for coordinating the food unit to provide feeding resources for those responders at the scene. Public health staff will serve in the recycling group to manage the flow of solid waste out of the recovery operations. 
and this led to a much stronger response to the ice storm event. As we wrap our course today, we step back and we take a look at everything we've discussed. And it's really been a lot. We started out talking about the disaster response cycle and who responds in the event of a disaster. Is it fire, police, EMS, the National Guard, the Red Cross, and of course, as we've discussed today, it's also public health. We talked about the incident command system, not only its underlying principles and how it's organized, but how public health as a jack-of-all-trades operation can plug into so many different areas in that incident command system, whether it's in the operations section, the planning section, or up in the command section, and the important roles that public health staff plays in all of those different areas. But most importantly, we talked about the importance of pre-planning and training of a comprehensive nature that includes everyone who will be involved in the response event, from public health to police to fire to EMS and other governmental agencies, so that you plan together, you train together, and then you can execute together to serve the citizens in your jurisdiction.